of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Uh, today's, uh, today's epistle has long been one of my favorites. And so I'd like to read it again from you, from the, uh, the English Standard Version. And I'd like you to do something. I'd like you to close your eyes. And I would like you to imagine that you're hearing these words for the first time ever. And I would like you to listen in that way. And to listen as though your lives depended on it. Um, because they do. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. You can open your eyes. Thank you. I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord. Um, toward the end of his life, um, St. Paul was in prison, but had an existence unlike what we would expect from most prisoners. And as a prisoner, he begins writing to his friends, begins writing to the churches that he's founded, but he makes an altogether different sort of request. He doesn't say to them, come get me out of here. He doesn't say to them, bring me this or bring me that. He doesn't say any of that. Instead, rather, he understood that imprisonment at that point in his life was his vocation. It's what God had brought him to, what God had led him to. And he understood that through that vocation, God would use that. And he did. Because that's how Paul got to Rome. That's how Paul got to deliver the message to the very heart and center, the social, economic, and political capital of the world, Rome itself. He got there and did what he did because he was a prisoner. He understood that was his vocation. He understood that was his calling. And he was so serious about it. He also understood that part of his vocation was that in his person, he represented Christ to all those churches that he had founded. He understood that in his person, he brought Christ to them. He also understood that in his absence, his letters did the same. And that's what he was all about. His ministry was all about revealing the mysteries of the kingdom of God to all these churches that he had founded. And he did it in his person and in his letters. And toward the end of his life, as he approached the end of his days, knowing that he would no longer be able to do that in person or by letter, he wrote to them in a different vein. He wrote to them all about unity. He wrote to them all about discovering the things that he had taught them and to claim those things for themselves. He urged them to become the body of Christ. He urged them to become the people of God and to experience within themselves all the graces and all the gifts and all the wonderful promises he had told them of. And so toward the end of his life, that was his focus, to get them to become the church by themselves and for themselves. And that's what he did. Christ ushered, you know, ushered in the kingdom of God. Paul, under his grace and inspiration, formed the church as we know it now. There were others, of course, uh, but Paul had such a big role to play in all of that. And, you know, we, we sometimes stop and we ask ourselves, what happened? Where is that church now? Does it still exist? Are we still a part of it? Where is it? What does it take to be a part of that church, to be a part of that reality? You know, we look at the church today and it's so fractured and divided and there's so much confusion and sometimes hate, you know, all in the name of God. 
So where is that church? Where are we? Where does it belong? I think answers lie also in some of the stories of the early church. And I'd like to share one of those with you this morning. We're told in the Acts of the Apostles that the early community was centered around something. We're told that the disciples devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles, to fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to the prayers. That's what the church was. First time I heard that reading, I was a first year student in the seminary, and uh, the priest was reading that during, during Mass, and I was, oh, I was thrilled. I mean, I was overwhelmed, you know, hearing these stories of the early church and how they got together and gathered together and, and began to share in this life together. And then the priest stopped and he said, well, that church no longer exists. And everything in me rebelled against that. Um, and I thought to myself, it has to exist. It has to still be here. Otherwise, what's the point? You know, why are we wasting our time if that church doesn't exist? And I made a decision then and there that I would find that church and that I would be a part of that church and spend my life in that church. And so here I am. Other churches can claim all kinds of things. I'm not here to dispute any of it. But I'm here to talk about the church and what we belong to and the great inheritance that we have and that we share. So let's look at that bit by bit. The disciples devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles. Do we still do that? Are we familiar with the teachings of the apostles? We have their writings. We have some of that recorded in the New Testament. We have further writings from them recorded in some of the teachings of the early church fathers. And we say that we're founded upon that. But I hear people say to me, that was then and this is now. And they had it so much easier then. Because there aren't any apostles around, are there? Have you ever met one? Have you met an apostle? You have. One of them is sitting right there. We believe in our tradition in the Catholic and Apostolic tradition within Anglicanism, we believe and we teach that the bishops are the direct descendants of the apostles, that they stand in this unbroken line of apostolic succession through the laying on of hands, and that each of those bishops has been commissioned by Christ himself to continue to preach and to teach and to proclaim to us the mysteries of the kingdom of God to reveal to us the mysteries of the kingdom of God. There are bishops and apostles still among us. We have that. There's no difference between then and now. The apostles and their teaching are still here. The early community devoted itself to fellowship. Well, that's easy. We have some of that here, don't we? Um, I've seen it. You know, I've seen it in the, in the conventions that I've gone to, in the clericus, the wonderful fellowship I've experienced with my brother priests. I've seen it here. <coughs> I've seen it in your prayers of support for Father Keith, in your prayers of support for Judy and for Georgia. I've seen it in your prayers of support for my son Josh and for your welcoming to me. I've seen that here in all these bags of food. That's not charity. That's fellowship. That's what we do. And what we do outside of this building, in the parish hall, every Sunday after church and every Wednesday night, is just as important as what we do here. If you don't have fellowship, you don't have a church. We belong to each other. We support each other. That's fellowship. They had it then, we have it now. The early Christian community devoted itself to the breaking of the bread. Right from the start, right from the start, they understood that the source and summit of their life was centered around their celebration of the Eucharist. And they began doing that right from the start. Celebrating the Lord's Supper, proclaiming that, and experiencing that love and that joy and that peace within themselves and with each other. That's what we're doing here today. Celebrating the presence of Christ among us, in us, and through us. 
We become his body. We become his hands and his legs. We become everything. We become everything that he wants us to be and everything that he teaches us to be through our sharing in the Eucharist. No difference between then and now. The disciples devoted themselves to the Lord's Supper. The disciples, and here's my favorite one, the disciples devoted themselves to the prayers. Now notice it doesn't say they devoted themselves to prayer or prayers, but that they devoted themselves to the prayers. The prayers. Right from the start, and even before Christianity, the people of God always gathered at specific times throughout the day and said specific prayers because they understood that they needed to make the whole day holy. They needed to make the whole day God's. And they needed to experience Him not just once a week, but throughout the day, every day. And so they gathered together for the prayers. Specific prayers met for specific times. Anyone here heard of the Book of Common Prayer? It's still there. Those are the prayers. Okay? That is our sharing in sanctifying the day, sanctifying the entire week. It's still there. We still do it. Saying the, the forms of prayer and some of the actual prayers that have been said for over 2,000 years. It's still there. We still do all the things that the church has always done. Maybe sometimes in different ways, different structures, different forms, but we still dedicate ourselves to the teachings of the apostles, to fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to the prayers. <clears throat> and that's so important. That's what we need to be about. And you can say to me, Father, don't other churches claim that? Yes, they do. And I'm not here to dispute them. I'm not here to argue with them. I'm only telling you what we do and why we do it. And if other churches are doing it, that's great. We know where the Holy Spirit is. We do not know where He is not. But we know He's here. That He's in us, that He's among us, and that He's enabling us to do the things the church has always done. And that's why we're here. I met a, um, back in my days in the independent Catholic Church, I met a bishop and was having a conversation with him. And he said, you know, Father, here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to widen the circle. We're trying to make the church big enough so that everybody can be a part of it. And I thought to myself, that's really great. I like that. But as the years went by, I began to discover how wrong that is. It's not about widening the circle. It's about making ourselves small enough to fit in. It's about making ourselves small enough to realize that our life depends on what we know and what we learn. That our life depends on doing those things. Being faithful to the teaching of the apostles. Fellowship. The breaking of the bread. The prayers. Our life depends on it. It does. And when we can make ourselves small enough to be a part of it and to let it overtake us, then we can experience with St. Paul what he wished for and what he hoped for, that we can discover within our lives the God who is over all and in all and through all. That's why we're here. Jesus said, those who humble themselves will be exalted. Make yourself small enough to fit into the circle. Make yourself small enough to be a part of this and discover what it means to be the church, what it means to be his body, his people, and devote yourselves every day to the teachings of the apostles, to fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to the prayers. Amen.